The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa, and the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this very moment. And for those of you who may be new uh, here to the Stoa or, or watching for the first time, uh, what is the Stoa? No one really knows. Uh, some people call it a communal podcast, a digital campfire, a wisdom gym, uh, and it's probably better not to know. Uh, one thing we do have here is a Sense Maker in Residence series. Uh, and this is a four part series over uh, a month where uh, a Sense Maker comes in and tries to make sense of the world uh, with us. And today, uh, for the month of um, October on Mondays, we are very lucky to have uh, our friend Daniel Schmachtenberger visiting us. Um, and this series is called uh, The Digital Porch. And the idea here is we're coming in with no theme or agenda. We're just going to uh, sit on the digital porch with Daniel and ask him questions. Uh, and this was Daniel's idea because the, the original stoa, uh, the original name of the stoa was the stoa pokeli, which meant the painted porch, which is where the Stoics uh, got their name. Uh, they just hung around uh, with Zeno on the painted porch, uh, philosophizing with each other. So that's what we're going to do today. And um, I will take Daniel in in a moment and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll jump into the protocols as well. But if you were here the last time Daniel was, was here, we uh, ended the session with uh, flowing through unknowingness um, sessions. So every Monday, uh, one of our facilitators, Tyson Wagner, uh, has um, purposes freestyle rap with sense making. And uh, it's on a different link usually, but we just kept it on this link. And for this month, Tyson is going to experiment with something different called rap unbattles. Uh, rap battles, you know, use kind of rap to tear people down, but rap unbattles is using um, kind of this, the same technique to bring people up. So I'm going to take in Tyson in a moment to just um, just kind of introduce this. Tyson, are you with us right now? If you're going to meet yourself. Hey. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, after party, following the digital porch. Come hang out, kick it. We're going to battle rap Stoa style. And the best part is, even if you've never rapped before, you can still play. So look forward to seeing you there. Cool. Thanks, Tyson. And so that's going to be on the same link uh, after this session, which is about uh, 75 to 90 minutes. Uh, we'll take a bio break and then Tyson will be tagged in and then you can, you can leave or stay and watch and, or whatever you like. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to uh, take Daniel in. And the protocols of today is if you have a question, Anytime uh, during um, the, the session, just write it in the chat box. Um, have it like a cue or question beforehand. I'll call on you, unmute yourself, ask your question to Daniel. Uh, if you want me to read on your behalf, because this will go on YouTube eventually, just indicate that in the chat somehow, and then I'll read on your behalf. I think that's everything. Uh, so <laughs> that being said, uh, Daniel, uh, welcome back. Good to be here. Thank you, Peter. It's funny, I'm seeing a few faces that I saw like an hour ago. We just did a live Q&A with Rebel Wisdom. So good to see some of you again. They're, they're jumping digital campfires. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything, I'll start with a opening question, but is there anything you wanna kind of set the frame for this series or for today? I think something that happened in the last Stoa session when it opened to questions um, and someone was describing anxiety attacks and I was sharing things that have been useful for me around that and various personal topics is uh, that's really fun. It's actually really fun to get to address philosophy and uh, practices that could be useful at a cultural and civilizational scale in the context of just what's actually alive for people. Um, and real questions, real dialogue, rather than just in the theory uh, place and with specific topics. So most of the time if I'm on a podcast, it is to share some topical body of content. And so uh, the idea of making a space to have no topic and just address what's alive for people sounded uh, fun and worthwhile and like it would probably end up surfacing conversations that don't happen elsewhere. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. Awesome. 
Um, and I, I sent a Google uh, um, doc for taking notes. I didn't know who's going to take notes, but someone's jumping in and taking the lead on that, which is awesome. And so the idea here is we're going to have um, each session will take notes, so we can have a body of knowledge that we can uh, work with. Um, so the first question I have, and someone basically asked it too in the chats, um, maybe if you um, feel up for it to describe the Consilience Project, uh, again, because I know you introduced it publicly at Rebel Wisdom recently in their, their War of Sense Making, and uh, you and I have been chatting uh, about it for a last little while. And someone had a question um, related to the STOA, uh, how can a place, a digital campfire like the STOA help with this project? So maybe like a one-on-one -on -one of the project and how can we help with it? I think I won't explain the Consilience Project from scratch since there are are a couple of videos that do that and someone can just check it out and I don't want to take uh, a bunch of time covering that since I think many people have heard it. But the Consilience Project overall is seeking to facilitate a development in culture where people have increasing value around both their own better sense making of the world and their ability to sense make other people's perspective, experience and sense making and communicate effectively so that we might be better able to do coordinated problem solving for the big problems that we care about that we're not doing a very good job with currently. And uh, making sense of what's really going on with climate change and environmental issues and whatever is hard by itself, like the complexity of those is tricky. But then to also make sense of how that's connected to geopolitical issues and market issues and other things based where one strategy that benefits a part of it could harm something else and different subpopulations are focused on different parts of the overall landscape that they care about more that requires pretty deep sense making of not just complex issues but how lots of complex issues are interconnected and how lots of other people are making sense of it valuing it how they're going to respond to get a sense of how do we actually move forward together and if everything that we do elicits a counter response that is trying to counter the things that we do and there's a kind of arms race of escalation of effective counter responses, the coordination cost is too high to really solve any of our major problems. And we are actually driving arms race in conflict in the process. So a cultural value around both better and more holistic and integrated sense making and better communication so we can coordinate particularly with people that see things differently than we do because we have to because we inhabit the planet. We just because we disagree with them and call them stupid doesn't mean they stop existing and stop doing stuff. Um, that's kind of the cultural set of values. And Stoicism as like one of the uh, schools of Greek philosophy had a lot to do with how do we increase our self-awareness and our emotional resilience so that we are not as easily hijacked by group think and narrative warfare and emotional reactivity that we can actually reflect on our values and our sense making and make good choices from that place and so if you take that as one of the you know one of those schools that was co-occurring with more of the kind of aristotelian pythagorean type schools of can we can we get logic better can we get science and empirical observation better and with the kind of Socratic dialogue type school, can we have better quality conversation and understand each other better? If I can understand myself, understand others, understand base reality, communicate effectively across those, the whole population can do that. We have a much better chance of engaging in something like collective problem solving or governance. So Consilience Project has certain things that we're going to do directly in terms of types of education and content that we put out to try to help make sense of current world events and teach people how to do that but it's also seeking to facilitate the cultural movement towards uh, these goals writ large, which means every project that is trying to make better digital tools for helping people search data sets and make sense of things, or better news projects or better public education projects or better trauma processing pro projects. We wanna be able to help kind of recognize all of those as part of a shared movement to upgrade culture and to facilitate those together. So I think the STOA has the ability to be a place where practice can occur. Somebody can learn an epistemic tool 
and then say, okay, well, what does this actually look like? How do I generate a landscape of all of the narratives on a particular topic? How do we steel man those? Are we doing a good job with it? How do we then move from steel manning a narrative to trying to actually empirically verify and falsify individual propositions? So all of the aspects of epistemics and conversation that one is learning, they need a place to practice. Awesome. Um, so we're having uh, tons of questions and they're all going to probably come at you from different angles. So, um, Rob, I'm not looking at them. So I'm just, yeah. <laughs> Rob, you're up next. Okay. It's a long one. Bear with me. Um, in my industry, there's a pattern common to many industries where the key decision makers have a great deal of capital and influence. Um, while the employees and contractors seem to have a lot more understanding of the systemic needs and pressures that we face and we, we end up losing the game of influence, those of us who feel more informed, um, even though we have the relevant info and plenty of will. And I think that matches the pattern that I see across many industries. Um, so the question is for those who are low in the hierarchical stack, what can we do to be more effective in making systemic change when the owners of capital have other ends? Yeah, that's a great pretty perennial um, social organization question. Uh, there's a lot of different answers, right? Unions historically have been an answer. Let's be able to get those people into some unionized force that has symmetry with um, capital ownership. Democracy has been an answer. Uh, so forming a union in the private sector is one answer. Forming a public sector where we say, let's make a government of, for, and by the people that actually has a monopoly of force even bigger than the top of the private sector capital ownership that can enforce rule of law. That's another answer. But of course, capital will end up capturing the regulatory body if the people are not fully educated, informed, and engaged in actively being the regulatory body. And most nobody here probably is engaged in government all that often as a citizen. So it's not of, for, and by the people governance. It is a permanent political class largely captured by an economic class and people that have other shit to do and then complain about bad government, but are consenting to be governed by rulers by not being actively engaged in their own self-determination. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of answers, right? So politics would be one answer. Unionizing would be another answer. Um, getting better at the game of power inside of the private sector is another answer. So figure out how to ladder climb more effectively so that you can influence things by being in the C-suite or in the board or uh, do a better job at capital accumulation so that you can influence things as a shareholder or whatever. What I would say is true across all of those. Another would be create public education to change consumer demand, right? So that the customers are actually demanding something different. So supply has to create something different because there's a change in demand. So those are all classic answers, right? But what I would say that they all have in common and other ones that we could give is that in addition to the intelligence one might have about the topic, there is a strategic intelligence that also has to be there. The strategic intelligence is doing like what we're doing right now. What are the different ways to be able to influence? What are ways that I could do? What are ways that I could move into increasing influence that wouldn't corrupt the thing that we're doing. And in this given situation of the various pathways, which ones actually make most sense and are most actualizable by the people asking it. And so what I would say is if you want to be more influential, because you believe that you have sense making that should be more coupled to choice making, then you actually have to increase the kind of intelligence, not just sense making intelligence, but the kind of intelligence of how influence itself works. Could you expand on that last point just a bit more? When I say how influence works, you could say how power works, which is also synonymous with how strategy works, right? Which is what I'm saying by a strategic intelligence. So, okay, if, the, if there's a game of power, meaning that rooted in things like private property ownership, 
is a uh, my ability as a person or a family or a corporation or a nation to advance my balance sheet independent of or even at the expense of others or the commons. And there is all kinds of evolutionary advantage to get more capital accumulation and have that capital in service of generating more capital. And there's scarcity of resource. And as a result of scarcity of resource driving value, there's a basis to artific artificially manufacture more scarcity if I happen to be doing well at that, right? As you, as you understand those types of dynamics, the underlying conflict theory, then you say, okay, those who get... Those who figure out how, say we started a market, T equals zero, everyone has the exact same amount of resource and position. People won't be equally good at the thing, right? Some people, um, partly because of luck, but partly because of orientation and aptitude and capacity, will start to get more resources in the system. And as soon as they have more resources, they have more capacity to generate more resources. They can employ more people. They can do more to affect the mindsets of other people through media. They can influence government through lobbying more. They can apply, they can contract private intelligence. They can make sure their kids get the best education, whatever, right? So if someone gets more resource, they both have the incentive and capacity to protect that asymmetry of resource and grow it. So then you end up getting a power law distribution in wealth. And that ends up being an inexorable thing, power law distribution. So then you say, okay, well, if I'm not at the top of the power law distribution, what do I, what do, I do if I want to influence this? Well, either I have to figure out how to get up there. That's a certain kind of strategic insight. How does that work? What, it, what, what are the ways to actually do that? Or I have to say, so there's a power law distribution in economic wealth. What are the other things that could affect that? Well, if I'm down here, I don't have symmetry of power up here. So I don't have real influence. But if I got all of us together, so that's, say, all of us as workers, which is a union, or all of us as consumers, which could create an influence on supply side. So can I do consumer education? Or all of us forming a government that could then bind this with rule of law? Um, or can I build a technology that increases my power through leverage, right? So these are basically strategic insights around how, do I, how does the game of power work? And in the presence of that being the thing that is determining what happens largely, if I have a sense that there are better things that could happen, how do I also develop the capabilities to see what the pathways to have in the influence are? Now, how one studies that, so that, I mean, you can study military theory which is a very good thing to study. You can study game theory, you can study coordination theory, you can study psychology, you can study the biographies of self-made successful people. Um, you can study um, types of asymmetric technology. For the most part, anyone who gets good at the game of power also gets captured by it. And so, in a way, those who, are, who seem like they have the most freedom and agency are also the most bound to keep doing the kinds of things that they have to do to maintain that position. So like it's, you can critique a world leader, you can critique Putin all you want for different things, but you're like in the presence of the pressures that NATO and the US were giving and the economic interests to be able to take as much of the wealth out of the USSR as possible and whatever, could he have really done something all that different, right? In the presence of ubiquitous game theory, you either get good enough to protect your people and do your thing or you don't, and you end up losing to someone else who's doing that. And so you can see that the people who seem like they have the most power are also the most obligated to behave in certain ways given that position. And for the most part, those who are pursuing power are doing it because of psychological dispositions to pursue power. And then that's getting conditioned in the process. And so then if there are people who are psychologically not disposed to try to get power, and they're more disposed to care about the whole, but they have no ability to influence anything, and those who influence it have given up really caring for the whole and or become completely bound by the nature of the system, that's that thing drives extinction, right? That separation of um, virtue, wisdom, goodness, and power 
those things have to be recoupled. And, and that means that anyone who has been pursuing virtue and wisdom uh, and goodness well, who feels like they have some insights into how to make better systems, also has to learn how to increasingly gain the capacity to be effective in the current world system without becoming captured by it or in service to it. Anjan, you had a question that would be good to take on that. Hey, Daniel, um, it's a related question. Um, how can you actually get better at games of power while still remaining game B committed? Uh, I'm thinking that you know, power corrupts or you get caught up in the game or, or just when I pay this mortgage off or I'll just do this for two more years, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, being kind hearted, you're also often at a disadvantage versus those who don't give a shit. Trying to see who is speaking. Is there a video on? It's not coming to the first page. He, he had his video off. Maybe that's why. Ah. Uh, okay. I heard most of it. Um, can you put video on and just say one more part of it? So I can connect to who you are. Andrew, are you are you there still or? Um, I don't have video right now. Okay. okay. How do you study the game of power without getting captured by it? Is the question. How yep. do you get effective at it without getting captured by it? Yep. Uh, partly. You have, to, you have to know what is actually sacred to you, that you actually have loyalty and devotion to beyond utilitarian success in the game of power. So you know what choices you don't take and what you're actually taking in service to. Um, and to the extent that someone actually has a real embodied knowing of what is sacred to them that is worth more than their own personal advancement or life and their life is in service to that to the extent that that's embodied and real and congruent is the extent to which they can be safe vessels for power then there's continuous blind spot monitoring and um, noticing okay, where is uh, some unfulfilled childhood recognition need actually coming up and affecting what I think is the most useful thing to do in service to what I care about that is really just recognition or actual com competitive ego dynamics or mate signaling or whatever it is. So there's the need for like, there has to be an extremely high value on what you actually value and a value on integrity and impeccability to motivate you to have enough self-inquiry to be looking at and adjusting those things. Oftentimes, like it was easier when someone believed in a all-seeing, punishing, and rewarding God because then there's a motive to be impeccable because not one jot, not one tittle shall go unjudged before the day of of judgment, right? And so, but if I don't believe in a judging God, then why not get away with this thing that I could get away with if I'm the only one who knows? And so then there's a question of, do I actually have a sense of what is meaningful beyond just what is that personally advantageous that is deep enough that I have a basis for self-respect that requires integrity that makes me require integrity of myself. Uh, the deeper that process is, the more someone can be a safe vessel for power. And then trusted people around you that can check you. Most people who get into positions of power get surrounded by yes men who all want something from them. 
and as a result, continue to say the things that double down on the bias that brought the person there. Um, if you are earnest in your desire to wield influence for actual collective good, then you should know that there are blind spots in yourself you can't see, and there is collective intelligence that exceeds your own intelligence about what is right. And so you should be actively seeking that collective intelligence about the situation and actively seeking it about your own self. Now that doesn't, you have to be very careful of who do you trust who they are as people and they're knowing of you enough that you're really seeking to share enough with them that they can give you that reflection, but that's important. To ask the compliment, Daniel, um, how, does, how does one not be handicapped by having a game B commitment in playing games of power? The example that comes to mind is Elon Musk just firing somebody, turning around and not even thinking about it twice, but somebody with a kinder heart, something like that being much harder. You can do the hard thing if it's the right thing, right? If kinder heart makes you so sensitive to that person that you aren't gonna make a choice that would be better for lots of people in the whole, then the kindness is actually myopic. If you on the other side rationalize this is the right choice for the whole. And so you don't feel any empathy for that person and you don't take any considerations around it, then you also become deadened and there's a dangerousness in that. So I want it to, I want to care about the experience of that person. And if I have to let them go, I want to feel that, but I also don't want my feeling that to make me myopic and not make the choice that is in service of the greater good. Uh, I have a follow-up that you can swat away uh, and it has to do with your personal relationship with power, um, especially when you've, you're, you're gaining uh, increase of influence and your voice is, is, is getting heard. Um, is there any moments in your life where you felt like you were in a wrong relationship with power and what did you do to correct that? Um, and maybe what kind of ecology of practices or relationships you have in order to keep you in right relationship with power? I grew up nearly maximally blind to power dynamics. And that was partly because of being homeschooled with no kids around, like even just the nature of school, schoolyard stuff and clicks and bullying and whatever, I just, I didn't get. And because of the great fortune of having like reading a lot and as a kid, but having being exposed to good things. So I was um, reading the works of a lot of the great philosophers that those were actually the people I was being exposed to. And that's how I thought people were. Um, and it was very strange because there was this, there was this kind of cognitive dissonance that I didn't learn till later where, cause then I got involved in activism and I saw factory farms and I just instantly wanted to kill all the people that would do anything like a factory farm. I saw the, the Yulin dog meat festival. And I just wanted to remove that part of the world. Um, but so I knew or study uh, how creative we've gotten with torture methods. So I knew that there was gruesome abuse of power in the world, but I was on the outside of it, looking at it and the few people that I was relating with were also on the outside of it looking at it. So then I had this kind of default that whenever I was talking to someone, I assumed they weren't part of it and hadn't been conditioned by it because we were only ever talking about solving world problems because that was the only thing I liked talking about. And because they were interested in that, I assumed that we were kind of looking at this thing together. So I ended up trusting people I shouldn't have trusted and then having projects be harmed as a result of that because I was seeing the highest in people and wanting to be redemptive all of the time and um, and creating an environment where the only the 
highest values and then more what were being talked about because the nature of the conversation. And then I also had people assuming I was playing games of power who were more power literate because they couldn't believe that I was as educated as I was about say sciences and I was as stupid as I was about the game of power. And I just, I, I just had a very uneven development that way. And so then they would say, you're just naivete signaling right now, assuming that I actually knew the game of power and I was signaling being naive to it as a method of playing the game of power effectively. Um, and I was just like, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't know. It was very, it was disheartening and frustrating. And so then I'm like, okay, I have to understand this. So then it was finally time to read Machiavelli and um, Robert Greene and all like that. And, and even then there was still an outsideness where I'm like, Okay, so I understand those dynamics, but anybody who I'm talking to about those di dynamics is, uh, and so it's been a progressive process for me. I also had this thing where it made so much sense and I'm so grateful for it, and yet it also seems so naive and silly to me now. Um, when I When I was a kid and for kind of most of my growing up, I never asked, what do I want to do? with my life, I asked, what does the world need? And what should humanity do from kind of this omniscient perspective, right? And that was very useful because I, I thought I couldn't figure out what I should do if I don't have a sense of what humanity needs. Like I'm embedded in this thing, I'm a part of it. So I need to figure that out first. But that meant that I, th I wasn't thinking in terms of my own agency of what I could affect. So I was, I had was thinking about the sense making of what would make it better decoupled from the how do we get there. That was both extremely useful and extremely naive. And so then had to get into the okay, so the enactment problem, we can't just do this and that perfect world system comes about even if we get some people to agree, how do we deal with the fact that the other people who don't agree to the non uh, nuclear proliferation agreement who build all the nukes end up then running the world. How do, how do we deal with those types of issues? And then there was like a begrudging acceptance of that the path from, if you will, game A to game B requires capacity in both. It is neither game A nor is it game B. Game A for game A's sake is to win at the game of power for the purpose of the game of power. Game B to be played in full requires that being the game or the context, and it's not yet. So the how do we move from where we are to there requires being able to not be beat by game A, right? Which means understanding it while actually not seeking to serve its aims, but seeking to change the nature of the game itself. And um, so that, that that's a, a little part of um, kind of my history with it. And then uh, finding people who I think understand topics better than I do, and seeking their input, and particularly finding people who understand topics better than I do, who disagree with each other, and trying to understand their perspectives more, and also where they agree and where they disagree and why. Uh, across topics. This has always been something super important to me and very helpful. And then also, I think I used to err in the side of seeking people's feedback for my own growth too much because it was because I knew that anybody's feedback about me has some value, even if it's largely their own trigger. There's still the question of why didn't I have the attunement to know that would be triggering to them. How could I have communicated more effectively to them, right? There's going to be signal in it, even if what they're saying is not objectively true. And that's assuming that they're communicating in good faith, which I came to recognize is not a fair thing to assume all the time. And it takes a lot of time because there's a lot of people and it's not all equally valuable. So then starting to say, okay, I'm going to be more selective in the people who uh, not who agree with me, but who I respect, both their good faith and earnestness and their perspective, and be seeking their input. Yeah, it's an awesome heuristic. Um, I'm going to sneak in a follow-up question. Uh, so, so something that we're looking forward to doing at the store eventually is develop courses 
and one that you know I think is is, is neat is having a power literacy uh, course. And as, as I mentioned to you, Robert Greene, The Laws of Power is coming to the Stoa soon, uh, where he's agreed to come on at least. Um, and you mentioned like studying game theory, the great, great people who, who achieved power. Is there any one single source that you know of that has the most bang for your buck when it comes to uh, understanding power? Probably Robert Greene. Robert Greene. I mean, what he did in the 33 Strategies of War and the 48 Laws was take a lot of the classics of military theory or political theory and break them into fairly simple principles and then stories that illustrate the principles and doing it across cultures um, and doing it in a popular way where you don't have to really understand um, what this particular period in Prussian history was about to get the cultural context of why they were writing that way or whatever. Uh, as far as an intro, I think those are probably the best intros. The thing I've noticed about them is most of the people who I have seen read them, the 48 Laws in particular, uh, get damaged by them. Because it, you know, there isn't something like a game A, game B context there. There isn't something like the problem of rivalrous games driving arms races causing eventual self-termination. It's just looking at history of what won and let's understand the thing that wins. And even in the introduction, there's this concept of um, the only thing that wins is the game of power. And so if you have any ethics or virtue at all, you better get good at the game of power because otherwise you won't be effective, which is not all that different than something I just said. But there's this subtle thing where it can actually, someone can interpret that in a way that rationalizes sociopathy. And um, utilitarianism in general can make you rationalize sociopathy. Hey, I'm doing this for this good reason, so I don't feel bad about the thing that I'm harming. One of the problems with utilitarianism is my modeling of the future to say, if I don't do this, this will happen, usually is more, I'm assuming more certainty than is actually warranted. And it's on the basis of that false excessive cer certainty that I rationalize the harm that I cause. If we don't do this thing, then China will do this thing. Well, there's like 20 steps of unknown stuff in there. But as assuming that thing to be certain and true, then I do a one step certain harm causing now. And this is tricky. This is where virtue ethics are needed to kind of um, offset utilitarian ethics. You have to be doing both. You have to be thinking about the process and the results and the recursion between them. There was a question that was bubbling up in me, uh, wanting to inquire about your thoughts on power relating to evil. Um, but maybe I'll put that on pause and throw another question to, and maybe you can decide which one resonates more. Uh, up in the chat, someone was mentioning about, um, uh, what was it again? Uh, sexual selection how that question uh, uh, was sort of dodged on the Eric Weinstein's uh, podcast or appearance. Uh, the, the person who said it was evaded, I haven't listened to that one. And then the previous STOA session, you said you might address it at a different STOA appearance, which is related to power, uh, sexual selection dynamics. Um, so yeah, I'll what, throw that out for you. What's the question? Um, so the question is, uh, do you, uh, so I'll read what the person said. Daniel evaded answering question on sexual selection on both Eric's and previous Stoa sessions. How does sexual selection impact game A, game B? So I can give you my sense of what a game B answer is, which is very different than what the most ethical game A answers are, meaning that different axiom sets are going to have us answer that differently. So from an evolutionary bio perspective, evolution is the result of mutation, survival, and mating. 
right? Some mutations end up being more successful at surviving and mating, they go through, and then you get recombinatorial dynamics in the mating of the ones that were able to survive and mate and that, that process. And so there's obviously a strong impulse to survive and a strong impulse to mate and a strong impulse to mate with whatever else looks like is also evolutionarily maximal mating opportunity. Um, and so a lot of people take conflict theory down to this level and say um, either the Malthusian thing on survival, humans reproduce geometrically, resources reproduce arithmetically, eventually there will be more people than there are resources, then scarcity of resource for survival drives inexorable competition over, over the not everyone can attain the same stuff. Um, that's kind of a survival selection answer. And it's, it's wrong, by the way, though. Uh, it makes all the sense in the world why Malthus said it at the time. But when he said humans reproduce geometrically, that was before the inflection curves in population had really started to happen, where populations were going down without exogenous pressures. And we can see in the Nordic countries and in Japan and in wealthier places that population curves have stabilized and even went down without exogenous pressures. And it was also before us getting the ability to create a closed loop material economy and recycle stuff and upcycle stuff. So we don't end up needing more resource that is only reproducing arithmetically forever. We can um, upcycle it. So that, that insight um, needs amended. And then when it comes to mate selection, it's a similar thing of like, if I assume monogamy is the social construct, um, and specifically for mating and that everyone has a biological imperative to move their own genes forward more than caring about somebody else's genes or society as a whole or whatever else, then there will be a place at which you and I both want the same mate. We both can't have her. It's, it's a fundamental, she's a rivalrous good in that way. And I either beat you or you beat me to be able to have that mating opportunity. Um, Now, of course, uh, not all societies have been rigorously monogamous. We can look at polyandrous or polygamous or pr promiscuous societies and see that there were different ways of relating to this, all of which still had some conflict theory and game theory. There were just different ways of solving it. One of the things that, one of the arguments as to why monogamy was more selected for, and there's many arguments here, and I, I think this is a, a deep, topic, but one of the positive arguments Brett makes, Brett Weinstein, is it was a way to ensure that all the men got to mate. And so they had to, when they were young, kind of posture, do whatever peacocking they needed to land a mate. But then once they had it, you had some social convention where all the guys got to have a sexual and procreative opportunity, and then they weren't going to have more. And as a result, if I knew you weren't going to, going to, try to mate with my wife, then we could coordinate together where if I didn't know that you weren't going to try that, then I have to always stay in competition with you. And if there's a bunch of men who aren't getting their mating needs met, they'll just break the civilization because it's not meeting their needs. So how do we make it to where all the men have their base needs met and then stop competing with each other because they kind of got the thing they need. Now, of course, that is an idealized version that pretends that adultery wasn't ubiquitous um, and, you know, et cetera. But, uh, My gain B answer is that the sexual impulse, I mean, and this is true even in monogamy. In monogamy, there's the recognition that you will have sexual impulse towards people other than the person you're married to that you're going to witness and not act on, right? So there is this recognition that you don't act on every impulse and that there are some choices that lead to a healthy life and a healthy society. And there are other impulses that don't, that you have the capacity to have some volitional override on. I would say that we can just extend that. Um, but it's that same kind of principle. And of course, in polyamory, there's a similar extension. I can witness my jealousy impulse and not be controlled by it. In the same way, I can witness my promiscuity impulse and not be controlled by it. Can I gain increasing sovereignty over my 
being hijacked by sexual desire and being hijacked by rivalrous desire or any of those things? Can I gain the ability to witness all of them and not be automatically controlled so that my virtues and values can actually be the basis of my choice making? And I would say whether we're in a monogamous, a polyamorous, a mixed, a whatever kind of set of social constructs, the basis of it is that, is that, and, and I think here's the core argument. And this is why I actually, there's a limit to evolutionary psychology that I end up being unhappy with the answers it generates all the time is we have capacities that were not evolutionarily selected for directly, but are the exaptations of what was selected for, right? So nature selected for the capacity for recursive abstraction because it led to tool building and coordination for hunting. But the, now that recursive abstraction gives us the ability to do things that were not part of our evolutionary selective environment, but we have the capacity. So it's not default that they will be deployed that way, but it's possible for us to deploy them that way. And if we, if we look in the rest of nature, other than humans on this biosphere, we are, we are really not like anything else in the amount of impact that we are able to have on all of the ecosystems that we're in and the nature and the speed, the speed coupling in particular. So mostly we don't compare ourselves to viruses or mycelium. We compare ourselves to apex predators. And I think people here have heard me talk about this before. Apex predator theory is not a good model for humans because Orcas can't leave the ocean and go hunt on land and polar bears can't go hunt in the savanna. We were able to become the apex predator in every environment. So rather than hunt to a certain level and then have our population checked, they also didn't start factory farms. They also didn't do species extinction at scale um, because, and I mean, I've used this example so many times, but an orca is going to catch one seal or one fish at a time, and it's going to miss a lot of times. And then you look at a drift net, a mile long drift net that pulls up 100,000 fish at once. And you're like, that's not apex predator, right? Like that dwarfs an orca's impact on fish populations so much that it's incomparable. So if we keep modeling ourselves as apex predators and needing to upregulate our apexness relative to the other people, so we have to deploy our exponential technologies of domination and whatever to compete with each other, we do destroy, we, we both drives arms races where the direct conflict is bigger than the playing field can handle and where the externality is bigger than the playing field can handle. So the thing I would say is that our choice making capacities because of abstraction and technology are evolutionarily unprecedented. No other animals can impact the world in the way we can. As a result of that, our evolutionary or our choice making basis has to also be evolutionarily unprecedented, and it can be. Um, and so our capacity to witness evolutionary impulses in ourselves and neither automatically be controlled by them nor shame them, just witness them, understand them, and then have a choice making basis that is more the result of um, reflection, abstraction, values, consideration is key to that question. Um, so feel free to swat this one away and I'm being playfully no nosy today. Um, but when it comes to the, the monogamy poly kind of uh, distinction, how do you relate to that? What was your sort of pathway and your choice? I have been happily monogamous. I've been happily polyamorous. I've been happily celibate. It was important for me to explore, be with nobody, be with one person, be with more than one person, so that I had first person experience of it, I had knowledge of it, and that it was actually a choice. Because if I couldn't do some of them, then it wasn't really a choice, it was a default. If my jealousy was so intense that um, my partner being with someone else would really freak me out and make me lose my shit, then... And, then when I say I'm choosing monogamy because of this, that, and the other value, that's really the rational backfill to, I just can't handle something else. Um, or similarly, if 
um, I couldn't choose monogamy because I'm super afraid of being trapped and afraid of commitment and can't control lust processes and whatever, then I say I'm choosing the other one and it's a default. So it was important to me to have experience in that I can navigate, I could navigate different models, right? I could navigate different cultural models, but who am I as a being and showing up to relationships with other people is deeper than the models. And does my okayness come from a specific model? Does it come from the agreement that this person will never behave in these ways? And if they do, I'm totally fucked up or that I definitely, you know, get the opportunity to behave with these people in these ways, or does it come from a deeper place than that? And so I can't like at this point, I can't really imagine being bothered by who someone chose to have sex with. Like that's just not gonna bother me. I also can't imagine feeling like I need to have sex with somebody in particular. Um, and so those are just not things that control me. And that means that there is not a obligation to a particular model of I need to get my needs met. I think coming to relationships from the point of view, and this is kind of like common US, California um, personal development language of like needs meeting. I think it, it can actually go in a pretty bad direction, which is, hey, I have these needs. We're in relationship. I need you to meet my needs is actually just psychobabble for codependency. And because the, I need you to meet my needs means I can't be not fucked up unless I control your behavior. I need you to behave a particular way for me to be okay. No, you don't. You were fine before you ever met that person. If that person died, you'd grieve and you'd, something else would occur. If that person was doing that thing that you really hate, but you just moved your attention to something else and got distracted, you'd be fine. It's the... But as soon as I say, I need this person to do that thing, I'm conditionalizing my happiness and then I'm making that true for myself. Now, of course, I might have boundaries of, I know the kinds of things I'm interested in. And if someone doesn't want to do the kinds of things I'm interested in, it just doesn't make sense for us to do this thing together. Like I'm, I'm interested in relationships where we're honest. And if someone else is not interested in honesty or not capable of it, I'm just not going to choose to do a deep relationship with them. But I'm not saying I need you to be honest with me. No, I don't. I can just interact with you differently. So I think the coming to a relationship from a place of sovereignty and wholeness, not from a place of seeking to get your needs met in it, is a critical part of navigating monogamy, serial monogamy, polyamory, any of those well. Um. So people are cheering me on to keep asking you questions. So I'll just ask one more. Um, in, let's say you're, you said you're happily monogamous, happy, uh, happily poly, happily celibate. What virtues did you learn uh, with each of those? What virtues emerged? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there are times where, I think there are things that can be learned in celibacy differently. I won't say they're the only way to learn it, but they can be learned differently than through other life experiences. I think they're all of the kind of tantric practices of notice sexual energy arise and see if you can learn how to move it. See if you can learn how to direct that in a different way and uh, direct it in to creativity and to other things. There's really interesting stuff one has to do when they don't just go to immediate release of a very strong evolutionary energy. There's also something around when you meditate and your nose itches and you don't scratch it, you just witness it, which says, I am not controlled by every biologic impulse that arises. I don't have to scratch it. Like I'm, I'll be fine if it just itches and I watch it. There's something around if I can watch a very strong sexual impulse and not have to scratch the itch, I become more trustworthy, including more trustworthy to myself. Um, there's also a place of being able to have a lot more attention with yourself 
that can make you both more reflective and more n noticing and integrating shadow elements and all kinds of things like that when you don't put a huge amount of your attention on other people. And when you aren't seeking to get fulfillment from other people right away, but seeking to notice your, where unfulfillment arises inside of you and inquire more into it and work with that, there's a lot of wholeness and sovereignty that can be developed that way. And specifically, if someone is coming from codependence, sometimes that phase is necessary. It's actually necessary before getting to interdependence to go through a phase of deep independence that involves even things like sexual sovereignty. Um, monogamy. Uh, in Forrest's, one of his, Landry's, one of his books, there's a line that I think is just beautifully expressed that the line is, uh, for every freedom, multiple new limits arise and for every limit multiple new freedoms arise and this is the recognition that freedom and limitation are words that can't be defined without each other or a synonym of them they're co-defining concepts but they're also co-defining realities and so the idea the desire for just more freedom is fundamentally a kind of immaturity as opposed to that every freedom has limitations that come with it, costs and investments that come with it, and I have to embrace them together. And so I'm actually not choosing more freedom in an absolute sense. I'm choosing the freedoms that are more meaningful to me. Um, so monogamy is a very nice structure to be able to give up some things, give up some freedoms, and feel good about it and not indulge feeling resentful or lacking or bad about it as an as a choice not because i have to because of something that i am choosing because of a freedom i want so maybe i want to be able to go to places of depth and commitment psychologically sexually emotionally with her where i have to create a safe enough container for that for that to be possible that's a freedom there's a freedom that we can explore certain things in that container that might not be possible outside of it and there are certain limitations I'm fully willing to embrace for that. Um, in open relationship, there's this idea, hey, that's common of rather than try to get all of your needs met from one person, which makes you kind of resent them and manipulate them to be someone they aren't. You try to force your husband to dance and he sucks at dancing, but he's good at other things, but you're disappointed in him because he's not that thing and you like it or whatever. How about just get different needs met from different people and love each person for who they are? It sounds like a nice idea and there's some niceness to it, but there is in a monogamous dynamic, of course, to some degree, we just get different social needs met from different people that we don't have to be having sex with. It's called friends and community and family that you can have intellectual and relational um, experiences with. But there's also a place of being like, hey, I want to grow with you, where the things that are really meaningful to you, I want to grow into and develop to some capacity, even if I wasn't interested in it on my own in that topic or that thing, because I'm interested in you, and I'm interested in the connection we have. And there's really, um, yeah, there's something very beautiful about that. And around saying, where we could diversify our attention into other relationships, we want to keep deepening it. And let's see how deep can we go into the depths of knowing each other and knowing ourselves through the way we know each other. So there's, these are all things that monogamy can do very beautifully, and there's more. And open relationship, and each of these also have a shadow, right? There is coming to celibacy because of just shame around sex and bodies or because of just sucking interpersonally and not wanting to keep feeling rejected um, or you know other things like that, uh, just being wounded in a relationship and just retreating into the wound. Um, there's pathological versions of monogamy that are really about control and jealousy and insecurity and trying to get your security met through a very secure structure or whatever. There's pathological open relationship that more has to do with immaturities around more freedom 
and a fear of commitment, intimacy, whatever. I think some of the things that can be learned in open relationship well is different people bring out different aspects of us. And the more intimate a relationship is, which doesn't have to be sexual, but obviously that brings a whole depth of intimacy. We've, we might find that there are, like it's a common thing I hear people in open relationship who are doing it thoughtfully say is, wow, I, I have went places in my experience with you that I've never went with anyone else, but that that's true for everyone they're with because there's just a, the universe is a big place, experience is a big place, and that the different chemistries of those people coming together make different kinds of like unlock different things. Um, the way they trigger each other, the way they facilitate each other, the way they muse each other. So that's one thing. The other thing is the ability to be very connected to someone, really not ambivalent about them, and also not try to control them is a very deep process that says, I love you. I want to be connected. I'm not ambivalent about you. And I ultimately want for you all the things you want for yourself that are good for you. And even if some of that takes you away from me, I want that more than I want to try to control something that is not what you most want. That's a very deep and profound and beautiful process of moving more into something that I think deserves to be called love than control and insecurity. Um, also getting to work past rivalry and getting to have a sense of like, okay, I'm doing this prayer about my desire for the well-being of all mankind and holding all humanity as brothers. But really, if you fuck with my woman, I'm going to hit you in the face. I'm just holding you as a rival and my prayers don't really mean anything, right? Like, so then there's a question of like, what does it mean to say I want for everybody and I want to embrace people as brothers and I want to have non-rivalrous dynamics. Like there's a very deep way and like the the more intimate the thing that's being shared is the more depth of intimacy in that relationship and the more overcoming rivalry and kind of interactions have to occur so i think all of those structures can be explored in a mature way valuably i think they can all be described in a mature way for actual shadow reasons in a kind of pre-trans fallacy. And that's what I see more often than not. I think open relationship is harder, just fundamentally harder than monogamy because monogamy, if you notice in our, in, when I say our culture, I'm giving a stat about the US, but I, I think um, much of the modern developed world is similar. When you look at the divorce rate and the infidelity rate and the people who are neither divorced nor in infidelity, but who are together sexlessly or miserably, um, it's pretty fucking high across those three, right? And you look at how many long-term marriages are there that are really fulfilling and beautiful. And it's like, okay, people suck at that just with one person. And it's because relationship is actually a hard thing. It's, I have to like pay attention to my triggers and my feelings and my wants and my worldview and my desires and somebody else's at the same time and neither compromise what I really need for what they want, which will just make me resentful, nor push for what I want in a way that will end up making them resentful. I have to actually, I have to be able to hold more than myself, but including myself simultaneously, right? And I would say everything that's hard in politics, this is a microcosm of. And then, of course, a family with kids. Now we got to do that for more people. <laughs> we got to be able to be tuned into and aware of this whole field of interacting people. Um, I would say that most people can't even deal with their own needs and feelings and wants and desires and thoughts without um, driving themselves crazy most of the time, let alone trying to do two people at once. So, uh, Multiple relationships are taking what most people are already barely only succeeding at and trying to say, now let's do multiple of those at once. Plus it's a second order equation because of the interaction of all of those. So um, I, I have not seen people do really well at open relationship who didn't do really well at monogamy. 
Um, I've seen people who claim they do, and under the hood, it's actually pretty fucked up. Um, but doing well at monogamy involves like being able to be really committed to someone and problem solve and work through difficult things. And an open relationship is actually being really committed to more than one person and being really committed to someone and the other people that they're with, right? As part of an ecosystem. That's just, if someone chooses to do that, they're also gonna choose to invest a lot of development effort in it. Yeah, that was super awesome. Um, so I'm gonna stop hogging you and then pass it to the question to someone else. Uh, just wanna be sensitive to the time. Uh, we're past the hour mark. Uh, are you okay to go to, uh, uh, 20 more minutes. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hannah, you had a question. Okay. So originally I was going to ask about, um, systemic trauma and your strategy surrounding that, but what is more likely to me right now is, you know, there are some people like us at the STOA who are interested in developing sovereignty. And there are some people for whom that is not a concern. And we work with these people and we're friends with these people and we're in relationships with these people. So what, what are your strategies for continuing to develop sovereignty in relationship to and in connection to this ecology of people who are not doing that? So there's a few ways to answer this. Um, so one way is you think about when someone uh, is transplanting a small tree, they plant a tree in a place, they put tree stakes around it because it hasn't yet established its root base. Maybe they put a fence around it to protect it from deer or whatever it is. Once it establishes its root base, you might be able to, you know, tie things to it and use it as a stabilizer. But to begin with, it needs stabilized. In people's personal development, it's that way for most people, where there is a desire to be able to be stable in a particular set of capacities or virtues or values to be able to help other people with it. But there's also the honest developmental recognition of when that's not true yet. And doing that will just pull the little tree over and that the developmentally right thing is to be around people further ahead than you in that particular line of development until it becomes stabilized enough that you can not be thrown off going into places that are further off and you can actually help. That's something I think is an important consideration. So the I'll say a little bit more about this because I think it's more important than most people acknowledge. The a Jewish saying, proximity is destiny, that who you are around is going to end up determining the course of your life more than any other single thing is. And it's true because as social primates, we're influenced by what we take in on TV and by our own thinking and by our disciplines, but we're more... And, and the physical environment we're in, but we're more influenced by the people we're around than pretty much anything else. And so being cognizant of that, and that's why there's aphorisms like um, keep the company of the wise and keep the company of saints and whatever in every culture that has some wisdom to be like, that's an important thing. And then of course, who are all the people seeking the company of the wise who aren't there? There's obviously a developmental recognition that people get to a place where that can be more of an offering. Um, so I would not try to help people ground in something you are not grounded in. That's the first thing. The next thing is when you're talking about your own desire to increase sovereignty and then that other people don't have that desire as much, maintaining your own sovereignty with respect to the, where they are. If you get if you get bent out of shape because they're not something else, um, that that's the place for your practice, not for trying to change them. Um, your ability to see them where they are at, accept them, accept your 
where you're at, right? And have some piece around that is going to be important. And then after those two, I would say learning how to be more effective at influence is actually important. Sometimes that's paying attention to who you actually can influence. And sometimes it's paying attention to what effective influence strategies are. But the foundation of effective influence strategies with regard to things like virtue development, always start with your own embodiment and practice. Any follow-up, Hannah? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Um, Jason, you had a question. Hey, yeah. Um, so can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so most of the time when, when I hear uh, the term collective intelligence, it's coming from the mouths of intellectuals who are a tiny fraction of society. So I'm wondering how can we foster a collective intelligence that's inclusive and integrates other forms of wisdom beyond just education or kind of like whether it's um, um, self initiated or institutional is there are there other paths that w that can kind of bring us all up to speed without becoming an intellectual it's an interesting question there's several sub questions in there that i hear um, one is does everyone have to develop their intellect for society to function well? And refining that would be how much development of intellect is necessary to engage as a citizen well. And the other question is what types of human development other than intellect are meaningful and can contribute to collective capacity in some way? And then how do we engage those effectively? And maybe also a question around, does everyone even have similar aptitude for all of the different kinds of intelligence? And how do we um, work with that? And like, those are all very interesting questions. Um, The term collective intelligence is a term that is not exactly synonymous, but close to synonymous with other terms that other groups use to mean more broad things like productive capacity, right? There is some relationship between those topics. So for the most part, traditional economists aren't going to talk about collective intelligence, but they will talk about a society's productive capacity and its productive base. And they will recognize that the invisible hand of the market is an emergent collective intelligence that is contributed by all of the supply and demand and innovation patterns across the interaction of all those people. So collective intelligence theory would look at the market as a collective intelligence mechanism and that what people want and the upregulation of who supplies that well and that driving innovation and whatever, that whole kind of market theory, you can look at that through the lens of collective intelligence and acknowledge that people's innovation, their creativity, their desires, all kinds of things are part of that, other than just their intellect. Um, there's obviously study in collective intelligence of types of group problem solving and coherence and choice making that are other than intellectual, like a tribe that gets together and they have a big decision to make. So they all start by dancing in a drum circle around a fire. And that doesn't seem like an intellectual thing, but what's happening is the drum circle itself is having the people do their own thing on the drum, but also find synchrony with each other. So there is a balancing of individuation and harmony right, of um, sovereignty and uh, uh, communion. And the people who are dancing are all doing their own dance, but all to the same bass beat. So similarly, there is a embodied experience of being an individual in harmony with other individuals. And that embodied experience where then they're seeing each other and seeing their eyes and having that experience, then they sit 
and they have a felt sense of their own individual place and their connectivity with each other that changes the state they're in when they go in to solve that problem. So that's kind of like a social technology. That's a pretty awesome social technology that evolution selected for for a long time that isn't what you would consider an intellectual process, but absolutely might increase the quality of problem solving of that group. Might, it might even make their intellectual capacities more capable of coming to bear. We can look at other things that it probably does, like move people from a more sympathetic to parasympathetic place, which makes executive function more capable and limbic hijack less possible and you know other things like that. So the question of are there lots of different types of knowing and intelligence that are possible and important, and can we figure out ways of engaging all of them and not over-norming on some of them is a super important question and well beyond the scope of me answering how we do that. Um, will everyone be equally intellectual? Of course not. Just like will everyone be equally artistic or kind? Of course not. Is there a minimum level of kindness and a minimum level of rationality that is necessary for people to be able to be part of effective social constructs? Yes. And this is kind of the baseline of what we would call a culture or a, yeah. If you think about the chakras as a model for types of intelligence, which is a good way to think about them, that each one of them was like a, a center of capacity or intelligence or wisdom or awakening or something like that. Um, the chakra corresponding to the solar plexus would traditionally be interpreted as being associated with will that the kind of intelligence that is, is related to what we were talking about earlier with like power literacy, is there's a, the generator question there is how do I relate to this topic or this situation in a way that empowers me? That's a kind of intelligence, right? It's a kind of intelligence to say, what do I focus on? What meaning do I give it? How do I relate with it that empowers me? Which is a different question than what is objectively true and provable. It's a different kind of intelligence. The chakra that we would associate with the throat having to do with communication. If I'm communicating, I'm not just talking at somebody. I'm trying to create communion with them. I'm trying to find commonality. Um, there's some purpose why we're talking. So I'm wanting what I'm saying to be received and land, right? So I have to actually put myself to communicate effectively, I have to put myself in the other person's shoes and say, how would I communicate this thing to them where this would land and wouldn't hit their triggers or be rejected? So how do I communicate effectively involves empathy for the other and self-reflection around what is true for you and what your intent in communicating is. Those types of intelligence would be associated with that chakra. And so the intellect, which is the capacity to discern what is same and what is different, right? What is, what, where is there sameness or commonality between things? Where is there difference or distinction? And then what is the kind of relatedness? Um, you can think of intellect, which is distinct from what we might call mind. Mind might involve a lot of narratives running and a lot of identity and software, but intellect is kind of just the pure compute function of the capacity for discernment, discerning truth from falseness, sameness from difference, those types of things. And that was actually a, in, in the yogic chakra system, that was the very highest of the chakras before union with everything. Um, what I would say is that any of the develop, like the human developmental philosophic traditions, I interpret that the highest thing they're offering is how to develop all of the parts of self for everybody. 
So we can say, oh, the, you know, the heart chakra, the, the path there is bhakti yoga about love and devotion. Or if it's, uh, and maybe the intellect would be jnana yoga and there are different paths and I can pick one. I think the more kind of well-rounded interpretation is for us to connect with all the dimensions of ourself and develop all the dimensions of ourself so that there gets to be a maximum wholeness of self in the fullest relationship with the wholeness of reality. So if any, for someone to say, oh, I'm an intellectual, I don't need to feel. Their intellect is gonna be limited by the depth of the experience of what those symbols mean related to the ground of experience, right? Um, so I, I want a culture where everyone values intellect and experience and artistry and awe and all of those things and everyone values developing all of those aspects in themselves in a way that is aligned and unique to who they are, not that everyone will be developing them identically or equally. Beautiful, thank you. Awesome. Um, so uh, we have about five minutes left, so let's uh, end here. Um, if uh, there's any juicy questions in the chat, maybe you can throw it on that Google Doc we have running so we can kind of save it for next time or anything that came alive. Uh, before I close out, I'll hand it to Daniel for any kind of concluding thoughts. This is kind of an interesting ride that we went down with these questions, but anything uh, alive for you at the moment? I'll just, this is, this is fun. It's fun to have a group of people that care about these things and want to take time to think and reflect and develop themselves and and create a community of shared development, both for themselves and in thinking about society and civilization more broadly. And the relationship between those of how do I become a citizen of the future I want to see? How do I develop myself so that I can actually apprehend that world and I'm a part of it? Um, and so that I'm more capable of helping bring it about, um, that kind of bi-directional relationship, super important. And uh, you know, when you um, offered for me to come and do the four times in a row, I happened to be in a, in a very busy time with trying to launch this project. And so I was thinking, okay, maybe we'll do that in a couple of years, but um, it doesn't actually take that much time since it's just questions and you're hosting it and doing all the work of it. And, um, and what I think, I think this community is actually very well set to help the kind of movement process Consilience Project is working on, asking these questions, being in practice around it. And uh, so, yeah, this is fun. And I think the intent or the hope was that these four get to build on each other. So we don't need to ask the same questions again. Mostly we'll kind of ask new ones and maybe get to reference earlier things we talked about. So be interesting to see where we get by the end of it. Beautiful. Um, so I'll make some uh, closing announcements in a, in a moment, but uh, Daniel, my friend, thank you for coming to the STOA uh, uh, during this busy time in your life. And uh, if you need the STOA and the STOA village to help you with the Consilience Project, just let us know. And hopefully uh, some of the, the questions that you're wrestling with will get asked here. Um, so I'll make some closing announcements for upcoming events. We got one tomorrow with Michael Taft from the uh, is it, uh, Deconstructing Yourself podcast. That's um, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And then uh, the most interesting man at the STOA, Nicholas Benjamin, has an event called Concept Unfolding. Uh, Nicholas, could you unmute yourself and uh, tell us what that's about? I think you're still here. Yeah, I'm still here, everybody. So <clears throat> join me tomorrow for part two of Concept Unfolding where I expand on my methodology for creating concepts and pushing the limits of our language. Beautiful. And that's at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and then uh, Tyson, I'll just take you in again, just to kind of, if anyone missed it, what's happening on the same link uh, after, after this wrap on battles. All right. Yes. Right here in the same room is wrap on battles. So it'll be an opportunity to practice dialect and good faith dialogue with one another, some healthy argumentation in a musical way. So join me, even if you've never rapped before, this is an opportunity for you to play 
and uh, have a good time. So I hope to see you there. Beautiful. Thank you, Tyson. So I'm going to have to bounce in a moment, but I'll hand over the host access to Tyson. Uh, if you would like to see more events, we've got tons of events coming up. Um, oh, I'm so excited to announce this one. Uh, Keith Johnstone, the author of Inpro, uh, he's like the founder, pioneer of uh, the improv movement. He's coming to Stoa. I'm super excited for that. Uh, of ContraPoints, the famous YouTube uh, personality, she's coming on, got a book that. Um, so a lot of events coming up. You can go to the Stoa.ca, check out our Patreon account, and then our Substack, uh, the mailing list. Uh, so that being said, um, I'll play some music, go on a bio break, and then Tyson will take over in a moment. So again, Daniel, everyone, thank you for coming out today. <laughs>